Senator from Georgia. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to be, op be able to speak as if in morning business. The Senate Senate quorum call. Mr. President, I'd ask the unanimous consent that the quorum call be vacated. Without objection. And I'd ask further unanimous consent that I be able to speak as if in morning business. Also without objection. I thank the distinguished senator. Last night, the President of the United States, in his address, in the preface to his address on health care, addressed our economy and current state of affairs. I think he made a very accurate assessment that we had hit the bottom and we were on the bottom. The question that lies before us is how we move from the bottom in this economic time back to a period of prosperity. Although unemployment applications for benefits are down, they are still extraordinarily high. In my state of Georgia, unemployment is 10.3 percent. In the United States of America, the average home in America, 47 percent of them, are worth less than is owed upon the house. That is a very bad situation which over a protracted period of time will continue to suppress consumer confidence and keep us at a low point in our economy. There are many, many ideas about what should be done, but I want to talk about tonight two things. One, something that has already been done by this Senate and the House and signed by the President, and something that I hope between now and November 30th, the Senate, the House, and the President can do. First, in terms of what we have done. Senator Conrad of North Dakota joined with me in introducing a piece of legislation known as the Financial Markets Crisis Commission. I enjoyed a lot of support from that, including the distinguished senator from Rhode Island. Uh, the appointees have been made. It's a bipartisan commission, has a budget of $5 million, has subpoena powers, everything the 9-11 Commission had, and has an unbridled charge to investigate every aspect of the financial markets, whether it's the rating agencies, the investment bankers, the regular bankers and traditional bankers, the GSEs like Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, every component, and report back to us by the end of next year, which is right after the midterm election, on what it finds happened that caused the economic collapse that began last September and continued to mushroom until late March of this year. <laughs> there are some that are talking of a rush to judgment in terms of financial regulation. But I hope we'll take a pause, give this commission time to act. Let's find out what a forensic audit tells us of what happened in America in our financial markets. And let's respond to that after we have all the facts. I think a rush to regulatory judgment under what one might think for the best of intentions caused the problem could have the unintended consequence of having a more difficult impact on the economy than it should. I think this body and the House acted wisely. I appreciate the President's having signed it expeditiously, and I commend the Majority Leader, the Minority Leader, the Banking Committee Chairman, the Ranking Member, the Speaker of the House, the Republican Leader in the House, and the Majority Leader of the House for making outstanding appointments. The appointees to this Commission could not be elected officials, and they cannot work from the government. They have to be people knowledgeable in the field of finance, and they are ten of the brightest minds in our country. I have my ideas. I'm sure the, the presiding officer has his ideas. I think every member of the Senate has ideas about what did go wrong last year and what we need to do to correct it. But let's get all the facts on the table. Let's get a forensic audit so when we move, we move with due knowledge and in due course. The biggest mistake in Sarbanes-Oxley a number of years ago was a rush to judgment in reaction to Bernie Ebers and Ken Lay. And Sarbanes-Oxley, although needed, and appropriate, reached further probably than it should in a number of cases. The same potential lies again in terms of financial reform if we move too quickly or precipitously or without all of the information. <coughs> so in the interest of our economy, let's wait for this report to come back before we rush to judgment. Now secondly, on the 30th of November, the first time home buyer tax credit that passed this body last July and was amended in February expires. The first time home buyer credit is a byproduct of an original bill that I introduced along with a number of members of the Senate to provide a $15,000 credit to anybody buying and occupying a home in America as their principal residence. It got parsed down and finally in negotiations became a first time home buyer credit only, means tested for incomes of $150,000 or less. It has had a positive impact on the market. But Mr. President, America doesn't have a first-time homebuyer problem. America has a move-up crisis problem. Right now, no one who is in a house 
in the middle of the market from 200,000 to 600,000 can sell their house. Transferees from Georgia to the state of Washington, from Rhode Island to Florida are frozen. They can't sell in Rhode Island to buy in Florida. They can't sell in Atlanta to buy in Washington. The housing market is literally at gridlock. The majority of sales being made in the last few months are short sales and foreclosures, which is depressing further the value of housing. And the few direct arm's length sales that are taking place are in fact spurred on at the lower end of the market by the first time home buyer credit. So I asked the Senate to think for a second. What happens on December 1st of this year when that credit goes away to the housing market? Well, I'll tell you, I used to be in that market. The worst month of the year is December to begin with. Housing purchases are seasonal in the winter. December, January, and February are always the low months. You take away the single impetus that exists, and what do you have? Is nothing more than short sales and foreclosures and a continuing decline in equities and values. But if before that expiration takes place, the Senate could take a legitimate look at what's in the best interest of moving our economy off the acknowledged bottom where we are today. It's fixing the one thing that led us into our difficulty, and that was the collapse of the housing market. I would submit, if we took the $8,000 housing tax credit for first-time homebuyers, extended it to $10,000, made it eligible to anybody who bought and occupied a house as their principal residence, whether it was their first buyer purchase or their 10th purchase, we would move more real estate and move more impetus to the housing market than it has seen in the past 24 months. And as we do that, consumer confidence comes back, equities and values come back, the borrowing power of the American public comes back, and our economy comes back. Failure to do so, and we remain in the quagmire where we are today, which is no legitimate sales, declining values, a loss of equity, and a continued high unemployment rate, and a continued depressed marketplace. So as we come back from our August break, as we begin to look forward, as we look at the end of the year, as we look at those things that are terminating, those things that need to be considered, let's pause for a second and realize the good that the tax credit has done so far, as limited as it was, and let's make it better. Let's extend it to July 1st. Let's make it $10,000. Let's take the means test off. Let's give an imp impetus to the move up market. And if we do, values will return, um, unemployment will go down, our economy will turn, and consumer price confidence will go up. I would submit, Mr. President, it's a part of the main solution we need to take an economy that's on the bottom and move it back towards equilibrium and prosperity for America. And I yield back the balance of my time.